But I ask, I would ask everyone in the back to please sit down because we are about to start the last session and we need to, to keep a bit of time. We have to have a little bit of discipline in this. At the same time, I would actually ask um, Dr. Haida, um, the three others, uh, including um, Pani, um, Pani Katerina, uh, Dr. Katerina Shankaruk is on, I think is online. Dr. Uh, uh, Philip O'Brien, Philip O'Brien is online. And so is Ostap Krildik. Herman, uh, you and Dr. Haida are going to be uh, at our event here live. So of the four topics, this one, I, I, I sort of, uh, as much as I respect all the topics, this one is an important one because it's asking a very important question that we usually don't, because Ukraine has always been a subject rather than an object, or, or an object rather than a subject in global, um, in the global perspective or global affairs. So the big question here is, in the future, playing an important and respected role in global affairs. And um, the five individuals on, on this particular panel, every panel, you, you've seen it, every panel is aces all the way through. But on this panel, these individuals, uh, I think are the ones that can give us a very good perspective on what we think meant in the future, how Ukraine might play a role not only in the regional or in the Euro-Atlantic world, but on the global stage. Uh, something that Ukraine and Ukrainians have not never really sort of contemplated because they weren't sure that where they were important enough to contemplate. And so the five individuals we've assembled, I think Herman, starting with the master of all, uh, Herman, you've been with this from the very beginning. You've been with us from the very beginning, literally from Ukraine independence. So it's all yours, sir. Okay. Thank you. It's a pleasure here this morning. And I always wanted to say something. You learned something additional. Uh, I am going to uh, talk about. Uh, a type of indirect influence that Ukraine is having worldwide before I begin with the panelists. Earlier this week, I was in Vietnam. Some months before, I was in South Korea. And in both places, you hear Ukraine. Now, three years ago, if you were talking to ministers in those places, it wouldn't be raised. Why is it raised now? Because in those countries, as in all countries that feel threatened by their neighbors or are close to a country that's threatened by their neighbors, they have to think that if Russia manages through the use of war crimes, through killings, through rapes, through tortures, through nuclear blackmail, succeeds in this war, gains territory, then the hawks in Beijing, in North Korea, and in Tehran, and in other countries will feel involved to do the same. And of course, it's been mentioned many times, uh, if Russia is seen to gain, it simply will be a short piece before the next war. It's a history of Russian imperialism. So Ukraine, because of this war, has become the center of decision-making in many countries throughout the world where the situation as it unfolds uh, in the war is being closely watched, studied. Uh, we're going to take this panel in the order that they're listed in the program. The first person to talk will be Ostap Kirtek. Ostap has been part of Maidan. He was part of the Orange Revolution. He was an aide to Andrei Paraby when uh, both in Maidan, but when he was Speaker of the Rada. He's currently a Chair of the Ukrainian Strategic uh, Initiative at the uh, Kiev Mohila Academy. Uh, I've had a chance to work with Ostap at a number of times, and uh, he's well organized, he, he keeps his word, and is uh, a very pleasant and, and patriotic. Uh, Ukrainian, and we'll turn the floor over to him. Uh, dear Herman, uh, honored audience, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yes. Yes. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to speak on this panel on the topic of Ukraine's role in global affairs. I will stop in. Uh, uh, I will stop on uh, three specific topics. First one being um, global affairs and Russian-Ukrainian war role. Second one, um, the question of interconnection between destiny of Ukraine and destiny of Russia. And the third one, clear vision of Ukraine's future within the global context. So on the very first um, aspect, uh, role of Ukraine, Russian-Ukrainian war in the global affairs. Uh, this war undermined global security environment in a couple of uh, globally relevant uh, spheres, also including spheres very relevant to the core of the American security. First one is, of course, nuclear non-proliferation. The core of this problem were actually set by the Budapest Memorandum, which was, in my view, deliberately weak and therefore it undermined core US interest on non-proliferation of nuclear weapons worldwide. I remember the time when I was studying in London at Royal College of Defense Studies, senior military college, and many of the members were coming to me from different countries. And they were saying, now it's only the nuclear weapons that can guarantee you security. Moreover, um, nuclear blackmail and terror is, taking a stage uh, specifically with use of nuclear power plants as dirty nuclear bombs. And of course, uh, Russia is enlarging its nuclear posture, uh, declaring that the nuclear weapons were sent to Belarus with no reciprocation towards the Russia's escalation. Second uh, major global uh, issue undermined is global maritime order, the violation of the law of the sea. The total maritime blockade set against Ukraine may clearly um, set the precedent for the same scope of events in South, South China Sea or in Persian Gulf. It has also not been reciprocated. None of the Russian ports were blocked. Russian ships are uh, swimming in the high seas, delivering oil. Uh, the uh, process of deterioration is ongoing. The third one is food security. Um, Russia and Ukraine combined comprise roughly 15% of global food supply. Uh, and here, Russia is weaponizing hunger to actually blackmail uh, a lot of food dependent countries uh, maybe it's not that visible, but for instance, Saudi Arabia or Egypt, African countries, and China and India are dependent on food supply, uh, including food supply from Ukraine. Uh, the fourth issue, which is not that much visible, but I believe it's the news of the next day, it's the use of artificial intelligence in wars the end possible proliferation of the war AI. Uh, right now, one of the mm, specific moments struck me, Russia is producing, according to the data, approximately 120 to 140 Shahed drones a day. Usually when attack is launched on Ukraine, 10 to 20 to 30 are used. The other are stockpiled. So uh, my take is Russia is mounting a massive swarm of drones to be used on a specific day and swarms are to be managed by AI. So something is to be watched, something is to be happening. And the fifth one, uh, again, the news of tomorrow, the quantity of the accidents with the use of chemical weapons of Russia against Ukraine are being mounted they are mostly kept either secret or with a very limited Ukrainian uh, coverage, but uh, there are dozens and maybe even more of those accidents and uh, more 
are happening and more are to happen. So overall, um, all those cases which I named could not be, uh, cannot and couldn't have been resolved by the uh, local Minsk format, which was created for the bilateral talks and with the Normandy format, which was regional. Uh, overall, um, strategy to, to put peace in place was completely wrong. We have global problems and we need to tackle them on a global level. So I think United Nations really failed with tackling Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, at a specific time, League of Nations have, uh, has had enough principle to expel Nazi Germany and then Soviet Union in late 1930s. Right now, Russia gets along with that and still continues to preside in the UN Security Council, making the most important global institution fully dysfunctional on the matter of Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, OSC uh, is even more discredited to the extent that OS, uh, OSC missions were used uh, for reconnaissance of Russian troops to later strike Ukrainian positions before 2022. Mm. Yes, NATO and European Union are reviving, but their mechanisms are not done for the war times. And we see how paralyzed they are in tough moments, how, uh, uh, how the lowest possible result is achieved because of consensus to be put in place. Uh, on G7, even with strong rhetorics, Overall policy of sanctions did not crush Russian economy, didn't close it. Uh, so again, this uh, global community did not really deliver on deterring Russia to wage war on Ukraine. And G20 is to me a bit similar to the United Nations where opinions are heard, but decisions cannot be made. Let me turn to the issue of interconnection of Ukraine's destiny and destiny of Russia. Uh, let me put it this way. Destiny of Ukraine will define destiny of Russia. Destiny of Russia will define destiny of Asia and of the whole world. Right now, I will speak um, in a bit futuristic terms. Imagine we are sitting with you in 1985 and we are talking about Poland joining NATO and Soviet Union collapsing. That would have sounded mad, wouldn't have it be. But right now we live in that reality and that's how we should upscale our thinking to see possible global processes. And if we miss to see them, if we miss policy making for that future, we will uh, emerge in the same situation as it was in 1917 when Russian empire was collapsing, and there was no policy how to manage that dying, the collapsing empire. It got reconnected and it brought us Red Terror, then it brought Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, then it brought us the Cold War. When strategy of tackling empire of evil under Reagan was assembled in 1980s, it delivered the collapse of the Soviet Union. The problem was West was not ready for victory, but West did not have any strategy. That's where we, get, where we got chicken Kiev thinking. And I'm afraid that we are still stuck in chicken Kiev thinking. So chicken Kiev thinking brought us first Abkhazia, then butchery in Ichkeria, Transnistria, Karabakh, and then uh, attack on Crimea and Donbas. Then it brought us uh, Russian atrocities in Syria, Russia's strengthening of Venezuela and Wagner's adventures in Africa further undermining order there. To end Russia's war against Ukraine, we must end Russian empire, Cartago de Lenda Est. It will stop creation of the Russia, China, North Korea, Iran axis from emerging, from um, maturing and from fully challenging the West, which is ongoing right now. 
I believe that future of Russian empire should be considered in terms not of what we expect to happen, but in terms what we intend to make. And here, uh, I believe this will be a reciprocity because uh, anybody who read Surkov leaks saw the project of seven Afro-American states being created in the US. So Russia already considers the options, the policy options on how to destroy the US. I'm not speaking of influence operations of Russia in the UK, in Germany and in France, which is a clear intervention into the internal affairs and breach of sovereignty. All of this has happened, West did not reciprocate. So um, a Ukrainian analyst, Rostislav Martinuk, an expert on Finno-Hungarian uh, nations of Russia, believes that Russian empire should collapse under the Latin American scenario. So um, Paraguay and Uruguay, Peru, Chile, Argentina, none of those states existed before the collapse of the Spanish empire. Right now, we need to look into Russia as a, uh, a potentially similar space where territorial identities in connection with some of the uh, identities of indigenous people might give us a result. Ukraine is to play a core role in this process. Uh, Mr. Blank, for instance, or Dr. Zavitsky, remember it very well when in late 80s, it was Ukraine who broke the backbone of the Soviet Union. Right now, Ukraine's role in liberation of the captive nations of Russia and letting the last land empire of the world collapse will be enormous. Ukraine should assist those new nations in, nation, in state building, and we should serve as a core partner of West in order to balance and deter China from its rapid advance to the territories in the vacuum which might be created when Russian empire collapses. It will take decades to create democratic republics there because in order to have democracy, you have to have citizens. Empires rarely produce citizens. And here we also have to remember of possible revival of the Ukrainian diaspora in Russia, especially in, on the high north. Uh, Yakutia, Vorkuta, uh, Murmansk, those places are in some cases 25 to 50% ethnic Ukrainian. And a collapse of Russian empire will have global implications from a collapse regime, uh, of regime in Belarus, from collapse some of Wagner-backed regimes in Africa and weakening of the Venezuela regime, to similar processes which might start in other totalitarian states from Iran to China. And to conclude, we need clear vision of Ukraine's future. Right now, we, we are stuck. Counterattack is slow. Reconstruction of Ukraine, the Marshall Plan, which was loud half a year ago, now is completely silenced. What can you rebuild when the war is waging, when the war is ongoing? What's the next big thing? Can Russia win just by playing time? Can Russia just continue as it is and then what? So, uh, I do believe that we are to be ready for something which we should call hot cold war. Right now on the hot stage of it, we have to sustain Ukraine and we, I mean Ukraine ourselves first and foremost, uh, putting proper governors in place, fighting corruption and clearly working with our partners but also our partners should help sustain Ukraine, clearly understanding that Russia will pay the bill. So there's no need to save up because later the bill will be covered. Uh, I believe we should fasten Ukraine's integration into NATO. Security first, there is nothing without security. Um, it's a bit to speculate on Western 
or Eastern Germany, North, South Korea might be a bit more appropriate. But those who speak that Ukraine is a new Iraq or new Afghanistan are enemies of the West, are enemies of Ukraine. The, those are dangerous analogs, uh, such as, for instance, analogs of Bosnia, and they, they are hostile to the discourse of Ukraine's victory. Integration of Ukraine with European Union will be tricky as the very recent grain conflict with Poland did show. Uh, there is much more things there and there is of course a conflict between values and interests. What is more important? Security for Ukraine and security means robust economy of Ukraine to afford war or direct economic interest of Polish farmers. This is a tricky question to answer, especially in the eve of elections. Uh, and here, uh, my last remark will be on the issue of corruption. Uh, in my understanding, corruption is a subfunction of bad governance. I don't think it is entrenched in Ukrainian culture. And I believe transparency in the digitalization will sort it out. Right now, I'm serving as the international liaison for the reform support office at the Ministry of Defense. And one of the reforms we are pushing is the non-lethal procurement reform, which is going to operate 2.3 billion of the budget money. And you will see how much difference will that make. To conclude, I believe that Ukraine should be um, a successful frontline state, guarantor of Europe's security, and it should be the factor to advance freedom and prosperity further east in perspective for the free, whole, and at peace global northern uh, community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ostra. No, sir. Oh, nothing. Yeah, I've got a monthly list. And then I'll swap the batteries. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ostra. Our next speaker will be Katerina. Sinkarouk. He's a senior lecturer at the Post School of Government and Public Service in Washington, D.C., where he has a specialty in Eastern Europe, European politics, European history, and international relations theory. Her articles um, uh, have appeared in over 30 uh, publications on topics of post communist transitions in Ukraine and across Eastern Europe. And we'll give the floor to you. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor and for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak on this important topic today. I will uh, uh, illustrate my uh, talk today with a couple of slides. And so I will share the screen right now and hope it is visible to all of you. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I would like to um, start the conversation about Ukraine's uh, role in, in global affairs with uh, this uh, starting point of Ukraine's agency that has been uh, so uh, vividly de demonstrated with Russia's invasion as a capability to actually overturn uh, some expectations and even uh, very serious stru structural op obstacles. And this agency of Ukraine uh, has been uh, also manifested through its uh, resilience, its ability to find flexible and uh, creative uh, solutions, which uh, brings me to the, my first point that Ukraine as a, as a global and regional player could be of a value added to a resolution of global and regional uh, challenges. And uh, 
on the global level, when we are talking about um, post-war rebuilding, uh, it, it will imply not only uh, rebuilding Ukraine uh, and reconstructing uh, um, uh, Ukraine in, in, in terms of economics uh, or uh, you know, infrastructure, but it also means that the global infrastructure, the international rules-based order will need to, to address the issues uh, that have clearly uh, been exposed as vulner vulnerabilities and weaknesses, where again, Ukraine could be uh, a, a contributor in a meaningful and constructive way. Uh, including uh, with the reform uh, of uh, the United Nations Security Council uh, and, uh, you know, with a potential uh, revival of uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. But of course, uh, the, these uh, uh, elements are complementary to the most important uh, question of uh, uh, building ba back better the European, uh, the Euro-Atlantic security order. Finally, when uh, looking at this um, global uh, level more broadly, we obviously Ukraine could also uh, have a meaningful contribution to uh, dialogue uh, between the West and the global South, specifically uh, if the story of Ukraine's resistance and uh, 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 fighting a colonial war uh, could be told in the right terms, if this story was actually uh, conveyed uh, and packaged in the right way to the countries of the global south. And on the regional level, obviously, when it comes to Ukraine's uh, future uh, EU membership, uh, it is also uh, as 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 uh, you know as as a major security player in the region you uh, ukraine and ge geopolitical player ukraine has all potential to uh, be uh, of uh, value added to the uh, regional cooperation with baltic states poland central european countries and uh, it it is obviously critical to the black sea security cooperation projects so I will further unpack on uh, on these points when it comes to the global level. Ukraine has uh, presented uh, the peace formula, which uh, actually addresses the uh, the war in Ukraine um, in a way that uh, should resonate and be of relevance not just to achieving peace in Ukraine, but also to uh, addressing global issues. And you are all familiar, with, most of you, uh, with this uh, 10 uh, element peace formula. But again, uh, if taken seriously, there is a potential for this formula to not just, as I said, address Ukraine's uh, Ukraine-Russia war, but actually address those issues that have led uh, and made uh, this aggression possible. Uh, as uh, this panel was uh, uh, specifically asked to address uh, uh, options of cooperation uh, for Ukraine with uh, J7 countries and J20 countries, uh, I have put up this uh, list of these countries to say that when it comes to J7, obviously the most important element of cooperation is Euro-Atlantic security, is, um, is uh, basically restoring the, the security in Europe and the security uh, uh, among the Euro-Atlantic allies. But when it comes to J20, uh, we see that uh, for the moment, the challenges uh, that are mostly faced uh, with uh, Ukraine uh, and uh, more broadly uh, the West having a um, meaningful and constructive agenda with uh, J20 are of the same kind that the challenges we face when we see that there is a uh, insufficient support of Ukraine uh, in the global south, specifically for the misinterpretation and misunderstanding of the causes and roots of Russia's aggression against Ukraine. 
But before we speak in, in greater detail uh, about the global cells, I also wanted to actually uh, uh, stop a little bit on the most critical element of uh, engagement uh, for Ukraine and uh, obviously uh, with regard to the uh, Russia's aggression, this is the uh, Euro Atlantic security order that proved to be um, vulnerable and uh, uh, enabling uh, in, an, in a way Russia's aggression. So uh, on this uh, slide, I just wanted to show two uh, views on uh, European uh, security arrangement. One is, uh, uh, and both of these views, I, uh, ironically, were uh, pushed primarily by France. On one, uh, on the left, you will see the European Security Treaty at Eurasian continent, which was uh, debated uh, even after Crimea annexation. As a, as a possibility to actually find some security arrangement that would include Russia, that would include Central Asia, that would include the security gray zone in Eastern Europe and uh, a European Union. However, uh, the reason why I'm uh, raising this now is that these hopes have not uh, produced any uh, viable results and ended up with France, the most uh, uh, you know, prominent advocate of uh, some sort of a pan-European security arrangement that includes Russia, actually ending up with a, a, a different uh, pan-European project that excludes Russia and Belarus, which is European political community that has uh, just held its third summit in Spain. Um, and uh, uh, when it comes to Ukraine's meaningful contribution, obviously it, it, is, it would be a critical element uh, to uh, the security uh, arrangement in Europe uh, actually able to sustain uh, uh, some sort of framework um, of a, you know, a, a sustainable security framework uh, that in, would include uh, all European nations. And um, this, this being said, I am not uh, discarding neither NATO nor EU integration for Ukraine, uh, but I'm just underscoring that uh, it may be a more clear and irreversible process uh, on the European side that uh, there could be no uh, some sort of... Uh, Pan European arrangement that includes Russia. And uh, it is really critical that this uh, realization also uh, becomes uh, as irreversible on this side on the, of the Atlantic as well. Um, so basically, when we speak about European political community, it is uh, also relevant to the con conversation about Ukraine's future membership in the European Union and how it can be of contribution. Because uh, obviously uh, it, it will, uh, Ukraine's uh, advancement towards the EU will create some sort of bandwagoning for other countries of uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, I am now referring to the Eastern Partnership uh, countries, but primarily, obviously, this would be Moldova and Georgia. Uh, the most critical element of Ukraine of taking Ukraine uh, out of the uh, of this uh, security gray zone, the, the security vacuum, is actually uh, uh, creating some sort of, as I said, irreversibility and uh, clear cut understanding that um, the new post war security order in Europe is not. Uh, uh, is not feasible if uh, this uh, secu security gray zone in Eastern Europe um, remains and if uh, Ukraine and uh, obviously other, other willing countries such as Georgia and Moldova are uh, being taken out of this security gray zone that has actually enabled Russia's uh, aggression. 
Now, when it comes to other regional projects where Ukraine can uh, play a significant role, this is uh, a project uh, that, that uh, includes a strategic partnership between the uh, United Kingdom, Poland, and Ukraine that has uh, evolved and uh, strengthened uh, significantly with um, Russia's aggression. Uh, but also, uh, the most important one would be probably uh, the th three C's initiatives, uh, which is also um, supported by the United States. And it basically warrants uh, further support because this is a critical uh, initiative uh, uh, providing alternative routes for uh, in infrastructure projects, but also energy supplies. Uh, outside, uh, like alternative routes, uh, uh, lowering uh, energy dependence on Russia in uh, in southern and central and eastern Europe. So this three C's initiatives and Ukraine is not currently is not listed as a full member because initiative was started uh, exclusively for EU member states. But with uh, extending Ukraine in the uh, candidate status, Ukraine also. Uh, was um, given the status of uh, associate membership in this project. Now, speaking about Global South, uh, as um, many of you may have seen this um, chart prepared by uh, analyt uh, the Economist Analytics uh, about um, neutral and Russia leaning countries uh, uh, a lot, uh, in the uh, on the globe that uh, may not represent uh, the majority of global GDP, but uh, represent uh, almost a majority of the global population, which means that when it comes to uh, UN reform or other global platforms, it is critical to get global South countries on board uh, in uh, uh, addressing not just Russia's aggression, but all the vulnerabilities uh, exposed uh, of the rule of the rules uh, based order exposed with it and uh, we can see that uh, on the on the level of the UN votes again uh, uh, the number of countries uh, voting neutrally or pro-Russia is um, is maybe not as significant as when it comes to uh, aggregate population and uh, aggregated GDP when it comes to China. And so my, my point on the uh, work with Global South is that it is uh, very important not to discard this uh, track. And in, in, indeed, Ukraine uh, is a valuable and meaningful contributor to actually um, reversing those post-Soviet narratives and that post-Soviet inertia, uh, where Russia succeeds in presenting itself to the global South as the only successor of the Soviet Union and all the positive uh, associations with Soviet humanitarian and economic aid. And uh, forgetting, for instance, that it was from Odessa Black Sea ports that uh, that assistance was shipped in Soviet times, and now those Odessa Black Sea ports are being uh, shelled and destroyed. Uh, also, uh, along the lines of what Astap has been saying about the grain initiatives. Um, the sad irony with this is uh, that although we we could have expected that with Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine in 2022, its global soft power index would uh, drop dramatically. In fact, it's just dropped by three uh, three ranks from uh, nine to thirteen, which again uh, indicates that we should not be underestimating the degree uh, of Russia propaganda and resilience of its imperialist narratives uh, in uh, non-Western countries. Uh, when it comes to Ukraine, we see that Ukraine's, um, that Ukraine's um, 
soft power has increased from uh, rank 51 to 37, uh, or, but between 22 and 2022 and 2023. But again, uh, there is still you know work to be done to to maintain and to uh, further uh, support these rankings. Um, to wrap up, I will just go back to the first slide uh, that I uh, like the, the, the first uh, rundown of uh, uh, Ukraine's potential contributions to the global and regional agenda and uh, reverse the question. Yes, we, we see that there is definitely potential for Ukraine to be of value added and to be of meaningful contribution to global and regional agenda. But what if Ukraine fails? What if all these dark scenarios that we are currently hearing and uh, uh, this um, apathy and negative negativism uh, prevail? Let us speculate in this negative way. Well, what would be the global and regional implications? This could be a question uh, for further Q&A, but I will just go back to this first slide and in a reverse order, we will see how all that would negatively and detrimentally affect the rules-based international order, the Euro-Atlantic security order, the ability for UN and OECE to meaningfully uh, progress in reforms. Obviously, the Global South commitment to any type of uh, liberal and rules-based uh, order, and uh, certainly the regional security, military, energy, infrastructure, Black Sea security, all this will be um, affected in detrimental ways. Uh, I am not uh, even mentioning what that would mean human, if in, in humanitarian terms for Europe. I will stop there and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Next presentation will be uh, from Philip Payson O'Brien, who's an historian and professor of strategic studies at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. His best known works are uh, how the war was won, air sea power and allied victory in World War II, as well as a well-reviewed uh, biography of Admiral William Blahey titled The Second Most Powerful Man in the World. Uh, Professor, floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me um, and that I'm coming through loud and clear. Thank, I, I really appreciate you having me. I am not obviously a Ukrainian. Um, and I would not consider myself at all a Ukrainian expert, uh, so I'm not going to speak from that point of view. I'll speak as someone who is interested in geopolitics and grand strategy and international relations uh, and who has, I hope, um, followed what's been going on quite closely over the last 18 months. So I, I will have you know, less Ukrainian knowledge than almost everyone else who is speaking here today. Uh, I was struck by the, the words we were asked to think about for this presentation, and that is Ukraine becoming an important and respected uh, power in the global stage. And those are quite distinct words, uh, and in some ways quite ambitious words for any power to be important and respected, um, requires a, a, a certain um, status, a certain a level of achievement, and a certain deafness of policy. Mm -hmm. Now, on, on one hand, you would say, of course, Ukraine absolutely has the potential to be an important and respected power on the world stage. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you add together many of the prerequisites to be uh, an important and respected power, Ukraine has them. It has an extraordinarily important geographic location, um, straddling sort of Central Eastern Europe and uh, almost linking it to Asia. So it has, you know, this, it's got a large mass. It is the largest country in Europe, um, depending on 
how you view Russia within Europe, but Ukraine is a, the largest European state in landmass. It has this extraordinarily important location. It has uh, the ability to produce massive amounts of food, which certainly makes it stand out in global terms. I think probably before this full-scale invasion, people had no understanding of just how important Ukraine was in world food supplies. It has particularly, if it can return the, liber the, the seized territories, it has um, excellent outlets to the Black Sea. And I think as this war has revealed to many people who did not understand it before February 24th, 2022, Ukraine has a strong national identity. In many ways, that was probably the, the greatest failure of the analytical community to understand just how intensely strong Ukrainian identity has shown itself to be. And indeed, it, Ukraine has revealed itself to have an adaptable uh, and flexible population that is willing to make sacrifices for uh, Ukrainian, the Ukrainian state. So, and, and you can't underestimate the importance of that. I mean, what the Ukrainian people have been willing to suffer, but on the other hand, what they have been willing to, been able to achieve over the last year and a half shows that they have certainly in terms of um, sort of societal adaptation, exactly what you would want. So stepping back from that, you say, you know, Ukraine has all or almost all the prerequisites to be an important and respected global power. Uh, far more, I think, than anyone understood a year and a half ago. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that it will. Um, many countries have prerequisites to achieve more than they do, uh, and they don't achieve those things, and certain states have far less, but achieve more. So if I was going to say what will make the difference in whether Ukraine can translate these different prerequisites into them being an important and respected global power, it's primarily how the war ends and the peace that follows. Um, so that we have to look now into the course of the war um, and the war will be settled at some point, there will be a peace deal. Um, unless it evolves into something like the North-South Korea perma war, but I tend to think eventually there will be some kind of deal that ends the war. And the shape of that peace um, and the course of the war will make a big difference in that. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means if you take a look at the different elements that I, I talked about before, you know, what makes an important respect to power, they will all be shaped by the course of the war and the peace treaty that follows. Just one, where the border is drawn at the end of this war will make a massive difference to Ukraine's position in the world. If those who support Ukraine, as I think we all do, um, see what we wish to see, and that is Ukraine having control over all of its legal territory as recognized back in, in 1990, that will be very different than if Ukraine ends up being forced. And uh, you know, I, I, as some would have said that some states would like them to hand over some territory for peace, or certainly as Elon Musk seems to be arguing for on a, on a daily basis on Twitter, um, that if those two, if that comes about, it will be very different. A Ukraine that liberates all its territory will be in a far better shape, not just because it has more territory, but because Russia is actually holding on to who, in many ways, the most strategic part of Ukraine. Crimea in and of itself is an incredibly valuable piece of land, the way it juts out into the Black Sea, the way it dominates the, the movement of shipping in the Black Sea, uh, that uh, there will be a very different Ukraine uh, if it does or does not get back control of Crimea. So I think that uh, is crucial. And also um, the, the Netsk and Luhansk have certain raw materials that are important. So it's certainly this will be a precondition. Um, Ukraine can be in, uh, sort of a minor version of an important and respected power without Crimea or Donetsk and Luhansk, but it will be on a much lower scale.
So it is very important, I think, that Ukraine end up in the peace deal um, with uh, all of its territory back to, to 1990. Uh, and that would be a precondition. Now, what else has to matter to bring this about Ukraine as an important and respected power? And this is interesting as to um, what matters. Number one, I would say, it has to have the kind of peace deal that brings the Ukrainian diaspora home. Mm. That Ukraine has actually, uh, I've been trying to ask around and talk around what the population loss has been, but the population loss, the Ukrainian population was already in a bit of a demographic um, decline before February 24th, 2022, but there was a massive exodus of people out of Ukraine um, of all ages, um, some very resourceful people, you know, they've made it to the United Kingdom, I'm sure they've made it to the United States, they're in Germany, they're in Poland, uh, they're hardworking, they're successful, and there are millions and millions of them. By one estimate I've seen, and I actually will defer to Ukrainians who would know better, the actual population in Ukraine now would be somewhere between 20 to 25 million when it might have been 35 million, 30 to 35 million on February 24th. And I don't think we can underrate the absolute importance of returning that population or having that population want to return to Ukraine uh, when the peace is signed. So that has to be made up uh, otherwise Ukraine is actually on its way to not being a large country. You know, Ukraine of 20 to 25 million people would make it considerably smaller than a number of European countries, France, Britain, Germany, Italy, Poland. Um, and it would not be the kind of power that it could be. So I think we have to make sure that one, the population goes back. <laughs> Secondly, this is probably the most obvious one. Economically, it has to be reconstructed. That the destruction across primarily Eastern Ukraine, but there's a lot of damage now everywhere. And as um, the first speaker said, there is likely to be a huge amount of damage to infrastructure this winter. I think what we are expecting is, well, Hopefully a lot of it will be shot down, but the assumption is the Russians are saving up equipment for a winter campaign against Ukrainian infrastructure. If this keeps going, Ukraine is going to be even more damaged and re will require even more reconstruction. It will require massive investment to clean up Ukraine. I remember that I saw the figure 86 billion, 186 billion that's probably an underestimate or just clearing things like landmines out of Ukraine let alone rebuilding the buildings, is going to take a, a massive amount of money. Uh, so you're going to have to get the population back. You're going to have to rebuild the economy. You're going to have to uh, try and get Ukraine back to its uh, 1990 uh, borders. And then you're going to have to give it security. That because in many ways, the point of the population returning and the point of the economic rebuilding are based on security that no one is going to invest their money in Ukraine if they do not believe that Ukraine is a safe bet going forward. If they believe there's any chance of another Russian invasion or another you know, perma war breaking out, or they are not going to invest the money that Ukraine is going to need to make itself into an important and respected power. Now, at this point, I'm sure you all know where I am going with this, because I think it's pretty straightforward. Ukraine becoming this important and respected power is now based on two things. And that is when the peace is signed, NATO membership and the EU membership are now de facto. Uh, that it has to be a clear roadmap into the EU. They will probably not have instant EU membership. It'll take a few years, but it will be stated very clearly that Ukraine will be admitted into the European Union. They will actually have to be probably faster admission into NATO. Uh, I, mean, I'm, I think there was a huge miss at the Vilnius summit 
uh, when the NATO question was fudged very, very poorly by the administration. That has to end. Now, I'm not one of those who thinks Ukraine will probably get into NATO before the war is over, but it is a condition of a viable peace that Ukraine is in NATO. I don't see how Ukraine can have security if it is in NATO, as we've just seen, Russia will not accept Ukraine as a buffer state. I mean, this war has brought out with great clarity, there is a difference between being in NATO and not being in NATO. And I was just in Finland and I had this discussion with officers in the Finnish army and they said, there was a difference when you signed NATO. We didn't quite understand the power of Article 5. And Article 5 makes it clear that all NATO states will fight for the borders and territory of all other NATO states. Once you get under Article 5, they said everything changed, sort of our mindset changed, our confidence of what we were um, came out. So Ukraine has to come under NATO and Article 5. So if all of those preconditions can be met, if you can get a good peace back to liberation, if you can get Ukraine on the road to EU and NATO membership, um, make sure the population therefore feels safe to return and investment comes in, then Ukraine has everything it needs to be an important and respected power. Uh, the question is whether that will come about and that will come about by the course of the war. But I think it is incumbent, and when you look upon it from the point of view of, of Ukraine's friends, we want this to happen. This is an extremely important thing. Ukraine then becomes, I'm trying to explain it to some of Ukraine becomes Turkey in the EU. When you want to see the kind of power Ukraine could have going forward, it has a lot of the you know, geographic location, size, uh, potential economic importance of Turkey. It's at, in NATO as a military power and in the EU. But that will all come down to the peace uh, and, and what is written on the peace treaty. So at that point now, I will be quiet and pass it back to people who know a lot more about Ukraine than I do. Well, our next speaker knows a lot more about Ukraine than almost anybody else in the United States. The entry of the Encyclopedia Britannica of Ukraine history was written by a speaker, Andrew Lubomir Hagen. He has a long distinguished career at Harvard. For a quarter century, he was the academic coordinator for Harvard's master's program in civil studies, and he recently retired as a senior advisor to the director of the Ukrainian research, uh, the Ukrainian research Institute at Harvard and been employed the during the arts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's always difficult to speak after an introduction like like this uh, because it leads to a disenchantment of the audience. Uh, I one time uh, when I was still working at Harvard, we were visited by a Polish journalist uh, who uh, subsequently wrote up his visit in a Polish newspaper, it mentioned my humble person and praised my spoken Polish, which he compared to Adam Mickiewicz, the greatest poet. Uh, it's, it's true with a slight Eastern accent. After that, I stopped speaking Polish altogether because one could never live up to a comparison with Adam Mickiewicz. So same here. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I must say that I'm here probably under somewhat uh, false uh, pretenses. Uh, I'm not, uh, that's the bad news. Uh, I'm not a, at all a specialist uh, or an analyst in global affairs. That is the bad news. The good news is that uh, in order to not to reveal too much of my ignorance, uh, my presentation will be quite short. Uh, and uh, which will give more time for a, a discussion and prepare the way for uh, the culmination and uh, the ambassador. Um, if I'm not a global affairs specialist, what am I? Well, I'm a historian and a lot of my work has been in uh, cultural history. 
uh, I've had a chance at some of the earlier sessions to uh, participate, and maybe that will make up a little bit for uh, this curtailed presentation right now. <clears throat> Now, uh, naturally, today uh, our attention is, uh, you know, has turned to the war in Ukraine. The situation is there, uh, and understandably so. Uh, so much of the emphasis at this conference was concentrated on the current war and the attendant issues and problems. Uh, still, the focus of the uh, uh, conference is uh, national identity uh, issues. So I will try to combine the notion of war with identity, which leads to issues connected with history and culture. And perhaps um, I will do so with reference to the uh, not so long ago proposed, but now quite widely accepted notion of soft power uh, prepared by uh, proposed by Joseph Nye, a col former colleague of mine uh, at Harvard. And I think that you're all familiar with the notion, which is the use of, uh, of uh, culture and uh, of all non-military, non-hard power means to extend information, influence, uh, win friends, influence people, win hearts and minds. Uh, I will limit myself to two general areas. One could expand it to uh, many more. One is um, a passion of mine, which is music and more specifically opera. I don't know how many of you noticed uh, about two weeks ago, the news that the Metropolitan Opera in New York, one of the world's leading opera houses has commissioned a new work to be written, uh, probably for a presentation within two years, uh, based on the current war of Russia in Ukraine. Uh, more specifically, it will deal with a mother's, Ukrainian mother's search in Russia for her child who has been abducted during the invasion. Uh, the composer who has been commissioned is Maxim Kolomiyets, who is uh, widely respected and has been performed in this country. Uh, I think that something like that is worth, I wouldn't make a count, but a certain number of bullets or, or missiles uh, for Ukraine's uh, Ukrainian cause. Uh, Many of you may have already noticed uh, last year at the Metropolitan when uh, the most, probably the most famous uh, soprano in the world, Russian, Anna Netrebko, uh, had her contract canceled because of her stance in support of Moscow. And the role she was scheduled to perform was given to Lyudmila Monastirska, uh, the Ukrainian singer who then appeared for curtain calls wrapped in the uh, Ukrainian uh, flag. Uh, there are a great many different approaches of how music uh, and other art forms can be used to further the Ukrainian cause. Uh, perhaps some of you know, uh, actually I wrote about this, but I don't think anybody actually reads this, um, that in, I think it was July, 27th, 1895. Uh, this is a quotation from a uh, study of history of Argentinian opera, which says, uh, this date constitutes a watershed in the history of music and opera in Argentina. It divides our musical history between the past and the present. It was the day of the premiere of the first national Argentinian opera by Arturo Berruti, named Taras Bulba. So the first Argentinian opera is based on a Ukrainian subject. The Argentinians themselves today don't even realize this, it's not widely performed, but this is a fact that can be used. Two years later, 
An opera based on Taras Bulba was presented in what is now Oslo, then Christiania in Norway, still under Swedish rule. <coughs> and the opera was titled Kozak and then the Cossacks. And probably the reason why the subject was chosen by the Norwegians was that they were in the midst of their strivings to separate from Sweden and the subject of Ukrainian uh, Cossack theme you know, uh, was helpful to them. Using such things or using uh, influences uh, of Ukraine in American music, of which there is an astounding number beyond Shadrick, beyond the, the Carol of the Bells, but I'm talking about classical music, etc. Uh, this can be extremely useful. Of course, art, is also important. We do have a Ukrainian museum in New York, which couldn't be used for such purposes, but there are other American museums which perhaps could present uh, the exhibit that was in Europe at the time of um, the uh, Maidan and the occupation of Crimea in 2014 of uh, art treasures from Crimea. It never went back, and the European court, uh, which had to study Russian pretensions for this, said, no, this will not go back, it's Ukrainian. I believe that this exhibit can be demonstrated as part of our attempts to demonstrate that Crimea is Ukrainian or that the culture of the Crimean Tatars is part of the cultural heritage of the Ukrainian uh, state. Uh, so that is one aspect. The other is, uh, is history. And here, I think a comparative approach can be very helpful in making uh, non-Ukrainians aware of Ukrainian history in comparison or in connection with their own historical experience and can elicit empathy. I think that the analogies between Ukrainian history and such events as the famine or the events of World War II, which have been raised here, and Irish history are very worth examining. We hear now in connection with the grain shipments and the difficulties and the possible starvation in Africa. Uh, and we, we also look and see that many African countries seem to be siding with Russia. Well, how about some examination of similarities in the colonial exploitation of Africa and the exploitation of Ukraine by uh, Russia? Uh, there are many other examples. Uh, I don't want to take up more time because I promised to be brief. Uh, and uh, I think we still have to tie up uh, the lo loose ends from this session. Uh, but uh, I hope that it, this may give some uh, seeds of thought of what we may be doing in the soft power sphere to aid the hard power we see at play on the ground in Ukraine today. Thank you. Cultural diplomacy is strong, and for those people, probably the majority of both populations, they don't read any books when they heard <laughs> the movies and the operas in our history. So that's important. I think we'll open up to questions. Question. Well, yeah, um, I, 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 yeah. I, I actually I, I, I want to have a question to everyone, but I'm going to start with you. Uh, you brought up the notion of soft power uh, and the Dutch. We were in another session, and I asked that question also. Uh, and perhaps it's up, and Catherine, and, and obviously. Um, how do we stop? Uh, that's what Ryan mentioned a lot of things we have to redo. How do we do what I made as an example? You know, quite a lot of women. Mm -hmm. She's at Ivy School. 
dark. And I found that she's teaching three training courses after the band, three training courses. First is, and she's doing it in the Department of Russian Studies. And so that Mark said, I remember the doctor says, yeah, that's going to take a while. But how do we get past that monumental mindset that in Western academia and media, we had a conference two weeks ago about that. And I talked to Diane Pratson about this, and I'm just going to ask you, and I'm just going to ask everybody else, um, for this panel in particular, um, how do you get past all of that? I mean, here you have um, ASN conferences, and, and you know that you know, you attended dozens of those. How do you get past the uh, idea that uh, Ukraine is a is an object rather than a subject, or a subject rather than an object, uh, and is capable of being researched on its own? You know, um, I, I can't answer you know in, in depth, but you reminded me uh, there is a receptive audience, even in Africa, the day uh, after the invasion, so it would be what, February 25th or 20, maybe 26th, uh, I was searching the internet and I heard the most beautiful rendition of Shenev Merla Ukraina in perfect, perfect uh, articulation. And I said, wait a minute, I have to check who's performing. It was a Ghanaian female singer singing from Accra, Ghana, in support of Ukraine. I don't, the name actually evades me right now, but, you know, there are people there, you know, who would be quite interested and amenable to look at their own experience in comparison with the Ukraine. It's a very different world from, I sometimes think about what would my parents you know, think of what this world is like. May I just very quickly tell an anecdote? Um, I was traveling to Ukraine, this is before the pan pan uh, pandemic, and I was flying um, via uh, Turkish Airlines through Istanbul. So I had to uh, change planes, uh, and in the waiting room, uh, there were two black gentlemen uh, sitting on, uh, you know, chairs, waiting, speaking in Italian. I was at that time kind of working on my very bad Italian. I had nothing to do, so I kind of sidled over and I said, uh, may I join you in, in my bad Italian? Said, Please. And so I asked them who they were. Well, it turned out that they were, uh, one was Rwandan, one was from the Congo, Roman Catholic priests, and they were on their way to Rome, which is why they were speaking uh, Italian. And they asked me, and how about you? Who are you and where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from the United States. Uh, I'm a Ukrainian-American. I said, oh, Ukrainian. Oh, you, you Ukrainians had a famine. I said, yes, we did. And then they said, one of them said, you know, the Irish also had a famine. Who had the biggest famine, the Irish or the Ukrainians? So we had this kind of discussion. And I thought, who would believe this? Would my parents believe that? You know, I, an American boy in Turkey, speaking in Italian with a Rwanda and Congolese, would be doing a comparative analysis of the Irish and Ukrainian famines. So, you know, there are now opportunities um, that simply didn't exist before. Thank you, Lou and uh, Maybe we'll give the other three panelists one last chance to close up because we're running out of time. But we can go. We do. We do have. Stop is ready to speak. We have. Well, stop. You want to have closing remarks? Yes. Um, I think the challenge of Dr. Zaretsky is concentrated on how does one. Uh, transfer from the state of being an object of the imperial policy or an object of a concept of uh, international realism, the balance of powers into somebody who changes the reality. Yes. I think it started with the Ukrainian revolutions. I do remember re uh, Orange Revolution, but I also remember the revolution of dignity and uh, expression of the deepest concerns from the side of our partners who were coming to Maidan uh, 
later on it turned into the aspiration to urge all of the sites to de-escalate, etc. Uh, it was us, the Ukrainians, who simply started doing things. Later, I remember us becoming objects again when we didn't really advance in Crimea. I was working as advisor to the uh, Secretary of National Defense and Security Council Tarbi by then. And it's a matter of history, but you remember how much pressure was on Ukraine when Russians started taking Crimea. That was the moment when I felt we were put in the position of an object. But then when Russians started advancing in Donbass, and again, the narrative was de-escalate and negotiate the answer of Ukrainian side was no, we've already witnessed what's happening. If we proceed this way, Crimea ended up as, as it turned out to be attempted annexation. So uh, it is very tricky to remain subject. It is pricey. Right now, Ukraine is subject because we fight. And uh, Remaining subject is hard, but here I would encourage our American friends to see Ukraine as a subject of a bigger added value. We as free people, we as people who take responsibility, we do more for us, for Europe and for the global security. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, th th thank you. Uh, I would just uh, like to uh, build uh, on what uh, uh, on this question with uh, what Astap just said about Ukraine's agency. That um, the conversations that and questions that I come across most frequently over the past weeks in uh, in U.S. and in Washington D.C. in particular is. Uh, what will Ukraine do if uh, there is a uh, you know, failure of political will on the US side to continue funding and uh, providing military support? And so, and uh, the, these questions usually come with the, a ready answer. And the ready answer is you should you know, seek some negotiated uh, solution. And usually this negotiated solution is not very much um, interested in uh, whether there is a, a, a genuine will to negotiate on Russia's side, but there is a, this, you know, assumption that Ukraine will resist to negotiations out of some sort of stubbornness, mm -hmm. and because there is an objective reality and objective political circumstances that will impose restrictions on Ukraine receiving further aid, well, there is definitely no alternative for Ukraine as to accept the reality, stop being stubborn, stop being stupid, and uh, act as adults, accept the reality. Well, I, I specifically, you know, uh, emphasize this narrative as a gaining traction to say that this narrative is missing out specifically on Ukrainian people and their agency. And not uh, this agency manifested not just during the revolution of dignity of 2014, but you know, decades before and in 2022 as well. And, uh, and to these arguments, I would just uh, bring up again the same answer. Well, Ukrainian people, see this differently. And when you come up with this question of what will Ukraine do, I answer, well, there will be three Ukrainians with two Kalashnikovs on the front line till the very last moment. But there will be no, you know, uh, there will be no uh, giving up on existence. And this is something uh, very important uh, maybe to add to the conversation in, in uh, the, the the power structures uh, in the in, in the US uh, so thank you for for your attention yeah.
Do you? Sorry, was that for me? Did you say? Yeah, that's where. Uh, oh gosh, um, I don't really think I could add much to that, other than I think the Ukrainian people have already made themselves now into a subject, not an object. That that it's been Ukrainian resistance which changed the mindset. I'll give one very, very brief ending. I started a project with Elliot Cohn almost immediate after February 24th, which was to look in the military analysis from what the analytical community said the war was going to be like before February 24th. And what we found is in, we accumulated a huge database of think tank reports, uh, any kind of you know, articles where people talked about the war. In 25% of the reports that were supposed to talk about a Russia-Ukraine war, Ukraine wasn't mentioned as an actor. It was completely what could Russia do to Ukraine. They didn't even bother to, to, to do much thought about what Ukraine could be. That cannot go back. I don't think that will go back. I think we've got a fundamentally different view of what Ukraine is now because we had such a terrible view um, outside. So I think in many ways, Ukraine has made itself into a subject. Uh, I, I have a question um, uh, for Professor O'Brien. Uh, I was very uh, intrigued by your comments on the demographic situation in Ukraine. Uh, I'm wondering, what is your assessment of the demographic situation in Russia? And where is Russia heading uh, in that area? Not in, in Russia. It's no, sorry. Uh, um, it's not good in Russia. Um, but Russia's got a larger base. I mean, you know, the fact is that the Russian population, even if it's not going in the right direction, we're talking about a country that's you know, five times larger than probably the present Ukrainian population. So it, for Ukraine, it's so important to attract that population home after the war and i think that's um but yeah, russia russia has got its own problems um but i think that that russia is still going to be significantly larger for a long time that's the last word thanks so much for the panel thanks I wanted to thank Herman. That was an age. I wanted to thank uh, uh, Gupko uh, for actually being physically present, but I also wanted to thank our folks on the uh, uh, on 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 Zoom. Um, I think that this I, I I sort of really like this particular. Uh, a, a set up um, uh, the the structure of of, of the presentations because I I sort of understood that the, where we're going going is to ask ourselves that question the final question Miss um, Catherine used the word ag agency um, I've used the word subject rather than object but it's the whole notion of whether Ukrainians can um, do something in the world. Um, uh, Without being uh, treated as if uh, as as something that can be manipulated by other people, and that I'm sorry that I'm getting too poetic at the end of the day, but that was actually um, a very important subject uh, subject matter for us. Where is Ukraine going with this, and can it get to the point where it will be? And I think uh, Professor O'Brien mentioned that where um, the world itself will understand that. Ukraine plays a real role in the world and will continue to do so for a long time to come. That's important for us existentially. So with that, I just wanted to thank everyone. I wanted to thank Herman um, uh, for the panel. And we now move on to the last session. And the last session, I think the word I will give to Andri, because I think he has the latest on what, what actually happened with, with uh, uh, Senator Schumer. And um, and I think Mike may have something on this as well. Okay. Dobry večer, děkuji. Thank you, everybody. Um, yes, if you got news alerts, you know that just in the last half hour, the vice president was speaking at a, 
I'm listening to myself on the YouTube. Uh, the vice president just spoke at former Senator Feinstein's funeral. Uh, this was the occasion now that uh, the crisis that is currently happening in uh, Congress uh, allowed for Senator Schumer to see his friend off at a funeral, which he was not planning to, as many people in Congress do uh, when uh, tragedy strikes, uh, because he thought he would be here the entire week trying to deal with that appropriations, which was promised for Ukraine. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people will have that on their mind. Uh, and with that, we quickly turned over to um, uh, Mikhailo Saukiu, who's the director of UCCA's Washington office. Uh, Mikhailo and I have been talking almost every day uh, since all of this was happening, even when I was in war. Uh, Jeshev, Warsaw? I was in somewhere. I was somewhere in Europe last week. Um, and then uh, many people in this room have been speaking with their elected officials. Uh, this week, I've attended a congressional fundraiser. I've had two lunches with staffers. Everybody's trying to figure out what is the next move. And that is why we're going to turn to Mikhailo for a little bit of clarity, uh, seeing as he just came over from Capitol Hill and everybody's trying to figure out the calendar. So there's a couple of things to be keep in mind uh, that the congressional calendar is constantly changing. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, keeping up with people. So for those of you like me, like Mikhailo, uh, I know the Ukrainian American veterans have certainly been doing their part in terms of contacting people regularly. And I also wanna do a big thank you to the enormous group of uh, American veterans who were out on Capitol Hill all day Wednesday. Uh, it was a group called Veterans for Ukraine uh, and they did the advocacy work that Ukrainians uh, have been doing. So uh, for all the people who say that there is Ukraine fatigue, for all those people who say that, as I heard from a congressman on Monday, that the Americans simply don't care for funding Ukraine. And I just had to point out that my father was a naturalized citizen. My grandfather was a naturalized citizen. My great grandfather was a naturalized citizen. There are plenty of people in this country who vote who do care about Ukraine. With that, Mikhailo, I'd like to ask you to give us a little sense about what's happening uh, because nobody really knows, but maybe you have a better idea. Yakuyu. <clears throat> Yakuyu and Ryu. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am not Senator Schumer. Um, but I will take your vote if you're ready to vote for someone. Um, uh, Andri had mentioned in his in his opening remarks and in his introduction of me to give you a perspective of what's happening in Washington. The problem with that assessment is that it's very it's almost impossible to tell you what's happening in Washington. Um, interacting with staffers, um, interacting with with um, elected officials themselves. Everything obviously is up in the air. And as I'm grabbing um, and grasping the podium right now, I'd like you basically to do the same thing in terms of all hands on deck. This is an all hands on deck type of opportunity, which we, frankly speaking, as a Ukrainian American community have never seen before. We've seen the good, we've seen the bad. We've seen 30 some odd years of ups and downs when it comes to US-Ukrainian relations. But at the same time, we've never seen what was actually just discussed in the previous panel, is Ukraine an object or Ukraine a subject of the matter? And frankly speaking, it's been a little bit of political football, meaning it's been an object of political discourse here in Washington, D.C., and in particular right now with the role of trying to find a new Speaker of the House of Representatives. So I give to you three perspectives. The perspective in terms of what is necessary for us as a larger community to do, but I do not want to limit it just to the Ukrainian American community. We need an assessment, we need to find the objective, and we need to find the strategy. What is the assessment of where we are at today of the current uh, war of Russian aggression in Ukraine? And how much is the United States, as the leader of the free world, engaging with all of our other allies to ensure that Ukraine has the capabilities to not just fend off the Russian aggressor, and not just to win in terms of victory, but also to make the peace happen? And I think that's most important because we always think about Abrams tanks to Ukraine's F-16s to Ukraine's and so forth. But after the victory, 
how will we maintain and achieve that lasting peace for Ukraine so that it can rebuild itself after 19 months of destruction of the full-scale invasion and almost 10 full years of Russia's invasion of Crimea, annexation of Crimea, and also of Eastern Ukraine. So assessing where we are and assessing how we deal with constituents, because they are the ones obviously that make the case. But I want to give you one particular example of how constituents can be used in a good way, but in this instance can be used in a bad way. During a recent advocacy event in Washington, D.C. for the Baltic American community, where I participated, where the Baltic American community was advocating fully for all types of assistance to Ukraine, they basically have their number one agenda is Ukraine. And while in a particular congressional office, I had asked that staffer to interact with that particular congressman and request of that Republican freshman congressman to interact with his fellow Republican colleagues, to twist their arms on the inside to make sure that they can vote for Ukraine. And this congressman went up to one particular member who had switched his vote from yes in the past to no in one of the recent National Defense Authorization Acts. And when asked by the congressman, why did you switch your vote? The congressman replied to say, in my heart of hearts, I know that we need to support Ukraine. But the thousands of emails and phone calls that came to my office to say otherwise made me, true, made me change my vote. That is a sobering, sobering example of what is happening in terms of the assessment of what is happening with the congressional dynamic right now. We have a very large Ukrainian community. We have a very large Central and East European community of, uh, of which our coalition can say we have between 20 and 25 million Americans in key battleground states, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, Michigan, and so forth. These are make it and break it states when it comes to an election. Yet at the same time, it seems that the winds are turning against us and the tide is turning against us at times when you get action from other constituents from the negative perspective of how to support you of, of how not to support Ukraine. Therefore, what is the objective? The objective is victory in Ukraine. But with victory in Ukraine, you also need political will. And the political will has to come not just from Congress, but it also has to come from the administration. So we need to be mindful in terms of what the administration is saying and or doing and marry that with what is happening in Congress. And I think sometimes the two are not necessarily um, um, at even or at loggerheads. And unfortunately, at times, they seem to be on different types of levels. So for us, I think it's imperative to understand the objective is for A, Ukraine to win, and not winning and not in it until the end, because we don't know what this quote unquote end means. We need the political will of the administration to make sure that Ukraine actually is victorious in this particular war. And the peace plan that comes after the war and victory for Ukraine is NATO membership. In nine months, we will have the 75th anniversary of the NATO summit here in Washington, D.C., where Ukraine was an object and a subject matter of discussion at the Vilnius summit several months ago and got punted to the Washington summit, which will happen in July of next year. This is our opportunity to make sure that the political will is instilled within the administration, again, as the leader within the NATO alliance, to produce results in Washington. And then lastly, what I'd like to say in terms of a strategy, how do we provide a strategy for our communities? How do we provide a strategy for all friends of Ukraine to make positive light of everything that is going on in, in, in Washington, which is almost at times very, very difficult. But I'd like to say that no matter what the discussion is right now in Washington, 
our strategy is to contact every member of Congress, not just Republicans, Democrats as well as Republicans, for the Democrats' sake, for those that have been supporting Ukraine without fault for the past 19 months, to reaffirm their support for Ukraine, while for the Republicans, it's to show that they too have a stake in what is happening in Ukraine and therefore to enlist their support. It's not easy in terms of that strategy, but I think it is necessary for us not to just pigeonhole for one particular party because I don't think that that's the way that we should be looking at society as a whole. Society as a whole, as we know, is a mixture of Democrats, Republicans, independents. Everybody has to have a stake in what is happening in Ukraine because this obviously, as we all know, is not just about Ukraine, that this is about worldwide um, democracy. So with that, I basically would, would, would like to say, looking into the future, how do we presume, uh, how do we, ensconce within the administration? How do we provide that wherewithal within Congress to understand what Ukraine is all about? And I come up with two interesting phrases and terms about why it's necessary for Ukrainian victory and for the defeat of Russia. Because frankly speaking, it's a matter of Russia will be, it will be either re-imperialization of the Russian Federation, or it will be decolonization of the Russian Federation. Now, Professor Haida had asked a question of one of the previous panelists about the demographics, what's happening in the Russian Federation. And, and he had mentioned that it's bad, but Russia will still be a force for a while. But that force, obviously, centrifugal, whatever type of physics that you want to associate with those forces in Russia, obviously are going to change sooner rather than later. And I think we, as the United States of America, after decades of fighting the Cold War, need to reassure ourselves that we do have a game plan and that we do have a strategy, that meaning political will, to make sure that Ukraine um, is victorious. So with that, um, one last thought in terms of almost what we say are talking points of why this is so important for the United States to continue this support for Ukraine. Why is it that we as Americans have to dole out $113 billion in 19 months to provide assistance to Ukraine? But frankly speaking, some of that is economic assistance, which does not go directly through the United States, but through international organizations. Secondly, is humanitarian assistance, which no one can say that the United States is not a giver when it comes to um, our sympathy or an, er, and our empathy of peoples worldwide that are going through tragedies. But that one element in terms of security assistance that's been given to Ukraine, the statistic is quite clear. It's 5% of the federal national um, uh, defense budget has taken down 50% of Russian capabilities in Ukraine. Wiped out 50% of the tanks, of some of personnel, of all types of military components associated with the mighty Russian army, the quote unquote, second strongest military in the world. And think about and think about even further in terms of percentages. That five percent of the national defense budget is only one percent of the entire federal budget of the United States. So one percent of the federal budget of the United States to take down fifty percent of Russia's military, without, as someone had mentioned in the in the audience, without American boots on the ground. As an economist myself, I think that is a great rate of return and a great rate of, uh, of investment. So let's think of it in those terms. Let's be very mindful of this when speaking with, with other constituents. Let's spread the word, not just keep this within our Ukrainian-American community. Interact 
with the veterans of foreign wars, interact with uh, organization, let's interact with the Lions Clubs of the world, the Rotary Clubs of the world, get them as actively involved so that they too understand that it is in their best interests. And for last example, just a few days ago, a new organization called Veterans Votes, Veterans Vote, had a uh, press conference with um, um, senators and or members of Congress with congressmen who were for former military. And they advocated for the continued support of Ukraine. Whereas unfortunately, a few days ago as well, you also had demonstrators in pink t-shirts walking around Congress asking for peace in Ukraine. We have that dichotomy in our um, society and we need, need to make sure that they understand that 5% of a federal defense and 1% of an entire budget to reduce 50% of a adversary's military is quite truly remarkable. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. I'm going to wrap this up, uh, Vladko. Uh, let me go in reverse order, first thanking our uh, patrons. Uh, we cannot do this without them. Uh, and so, as usual, we thank the Heritage Association, the Heritage Foundation at the First Security Federal Savings Bank, uh, the Yurkiu Family Foundation, uh, the Self-Reliance Federal Credit Union in New York, and the Summa Yonkers Federal Credit Union. Mikhailo was just talking about all the work that needs to be happening. Uh, it goes hand in hand with our financial institutions. Uh, just in the last month, the Suma Federal Credit Union announced two more branches in Florida. Uh, this past summer, we had a federal credit union open in South Carolina, uh, and we anticipate that we will have more of those happening in concert with our diaspora organizing, and that means more people talking to their folks. It's not a coincidence that the uh, federal credit union that opened in South Carolina, what South Carolina was the first state, the first state in the United States to put out a independence proclamation from the governor in deep red South Carolina. So, so long as we keep organizing and working hand in hand with our credit unions, we're very grateful. We also wanna thank our uh, sponsoring organizations, Ukrainian Congress Committee of America, Ukrainian National Information Service as uh, Mikhailo and I represent, but also our good friends at the International Republican Institute, the National Democratic Institute, Open World Center, and of course the Center for US-Ukrainian Relations uh, at whose brand new website this year, you can not only look up all the programs that we've done, we are uploading the videos there, but uh, bookmark that website. And as soon as Vlodko gets his uh, schedule for the next year, that's the first place you can see the schedule for next year as we've come to sort of uh, the conclusion of a yearly cycle, uh, but we're, we're certainly gonna be working more by the end of the year. We will start once again in, in the first quarter of 2024 uh, with conferences here in Washington, D.C. And lastly, the American Foreign Policy Council, not just for Herman's great moderation of the panel, uh, but also the American Foreign Policy Council is one place that you can sign up for a newsletter on any number of subjects, uh, whether you want to be a better scholar on China, uh, on Central Asia, or what's happening in Ukraine and Russia, uh, their experts send out an email almost every week. Uh, you'll want to subscribe to some of those uh, newsletters from AFPC. And we uh, actually invite everybody who's still here over to AFPC this evening. Um, American Foreign Policy Council, the address is in the program uh, for a patron's reception. That is the list of my thank yous. I thank you for being active in the Ukrainian cause. And uh, like we said earlier, there's only one path forward. It's victory. Do permohe. Thank you.